Amen. Good morning, church. We are here to work, worship the risen Lord Jesus Christ. And a note here about the bulletin. As you can see, every week we have in the bulletin five parts of our primary vision goals and our mission, which is worship, service, proclaiming the gospel in word and deed, discipleship amongst the faithful, growing and developing us in as saints, and also community, reaching out to the community and inviting them in as we go out and proclaim the gospel in word and deed amongst them. And also, you, you and Jesus, top it off. So we are a church that's built on the Lord Jesus Christ in these five areas, including you, of course, because without you, nothing happens. Without Jesus, it's a waste of time being here. So you and Jesus are the, the direction of our church. And there's many areas in discipleship, as you know, that we're uh, continuing to be active in, but one of our core areas is the Bible, learning how to be believers under the authority of the scripture. Thank you for the, your, your time. Morning, everyone. Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship. Well, it is only me this time, sorry. God reminds us boldly, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. You will find rest of your souls. Let us worship God, who is more than able to help and rescue us in time of need. Please join me in the prayer of confession. Gracious God, you have given us the law of Moses and the teachings of Jesus to direct us to the way of life. You offer us your Holy Spirit so that we can be born to new life as your children. Yet, O oh God, we confess that the ways of death have a strong attraction and we often succumb to their Lord. Give us the vision and courage to choose and nurture life, that we may receive your blessing. Amen. Amen. All the prophets testify, testify about Christ, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Jesus has set you free from your sin and the power of sinful bondage that attack you. You are forgiven.
Ellen has a moment for mission for us today. And before she gets into the pulpit, I just want to ask all of you if you have any idea why Pastor Jim has an Irish flag up here. It's coming, isn't it? And St. Patrick is the patron saint of Ireland, largely because he was a stick to it, minister of the gospel, and he brought the saving nature of Jesus Christ to Ireland. And so we are bringing this flag today as a reminder that sharing the gospel is very important. But we are Protestants, and so we are the orange part of the flag, and the green part, of course, is the Catholic. But I want to remind you, we are all one together in Jesus Christ. Protestant, Catholic, Orthodox, whatever we are, those who believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior are one in the church. All right, good morning. Good morning. So I'm here to talk to you guys a little bit about small groups and the um, small group ministry that is getting started here at Trinity. And I just wanted to share my experience with small groups over the years um, to kind of share a little bit about that with you. So over the years, I've been in a few different small groups and um, I just wanted to share once again what they have done for me and what I've gotten out of them. And being in a small group has just allowed me to grow a lot in my faith and in my personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And um, it's allowed me to just, being in a small group, it's allowed me to study the Bible more in depth. It's allowed me to form relationships with people when we are sharing our life together and we're sharing um, just our life with each other. And it's really um, a time we get to get together and. Um, share prayers that we have and to be able to pray for each other um, that's just such a huge thing too about being in a small group to be able to share our lives with one another and to be able to pray for each other too um, and then you know just small groups are just a more intimate setting where we get to like I said study the Bible together and ask questions and um, dig into the word more and get to really learn more about um, the word and God's word. So those are just a few of many things that being in a small group has allowed me to experience um, throughout the years. So um, when thinking about, you know, starting these ministries here at Trinity, it's really exciting because those are all things that um, we hope to offer to offer you guys is to be able to um, get those things out of it as well. So um, yeah, that's my moment for mission, just a little bit about starting small groups here. Amen. Thank you. And you're also going to find out that we're not just starting a small group. We are adjusting the small groups we already have to a model that we've adopted that is prayer, share, and the Bible. And so our small groups will be lots of different sizes, lots of different perspectives, and themes and focuses, but they all will have some prayer, some sharing, and some Bible. And we're not just planting a small group, we are planting a small group ministry that over the course of time will grow and provide support to the existing leaders and the existing persons in the groups. Thank you. Okay, and some announcements for us this morning. First announcement, uh, we're continuing our Friday Lenten organ recitals. The next one is going to be on Friday, March 26th at 1215. So our next Friday Lenten organ recital will be on Friday, March 26th at, tw at 1215. Our second announcement, this is a fun one, our Easter egg hunt. We had to cancel last year because of COVID, but it is on this year. And we will be going back to Mount Macrana, and that's going to be on Saturday, April 3rd. Okay, that's the day before Easter, and that's going to be at 10 a.m. So reminder, our Easter egg hunt is Saturday, April 3rd at 10 a.m., Mount Macrana as usual. Third announcement, we have a sunrise service that's going to be this year. To celebrate Easter, we needed more than one hour. On Sunday, April 4th, 
we will be holding a sunrise service to celebrate the resurrected Jesus. Along with the sunrise service, we will also be offering a continental breakfast. At 10 a.m., there will be a combined Sunday school uh, lesson, and as normal, our worship service is going to be at 11 a.m. If you plan on attending the sunrise service, we ask that you would please sign up or reach out uh, to myself or, or the gym or the Francis. Let us know if you're gonna be there so that, that, that way we can make sure uh, we have enough of everything. And fourth and finally, um, on Saturday, March 20th, that is Mitch, uh, Mr. Rogers Day. It's always fun being from Southwestern Pennsylvania. There's always so much programs um, on Mr. Rogers um, and his faith. Oh, hit the times for sunrise service? Okay, the times are, our sunrise service is going to be at eight tentatively. And at 10 a.m., there will be a combined Sunday school lesson as normal. And at 11 o'clock is our worship service. That was for the sunrise service. With a breakfast at 9. Yes. Okay, and that concludes the announcements. And, and the, combined, the combined Sunday school class will be a tag team yes. between you and I, yes. outdoing each other. Oh, it's going to be great. For the benefit of the faithful. The boxing gloves will be oh, on. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yep. Uh, I have one announcement, and that's, as you might have noticed, thank you, James, very much. Uh, I have one announcement that you might have noticed uh, in the newsletter that all this March we're dealing with the thoughts and perspectives from an article in the newsletter about God's word alive in people's lives. As the bulletin said, as believers, as the bulletin says, as believers, we can live and be victorious in our broken world by practicing some biblical victory strategies, such as look upon yourself as God sees you. See yourself as God sees you, such as know your life's purpose and live it. Value your salvation that Jesus Christ has given you. Get close to the Holy Spirit He's a person. Value your new nature that Christ has given you through renewing your life in Christ and direct your lives into God's kingdom lifestyle. To sum that up, the theme again for today is start to daily thank God for generating this new nature within you. Thank you for your patience. This is the prayer for illumination. Eternal God, in the reading of the scripture, let your word be heard. In the meditations of our heart, let your word be known. And in the faithfulness of our lives, let your word be shown. Amen. And today's Old Testament reading is taken from the book of Isaiah, chapter 40, it's verses 27 through 31. 
Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youth will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with the wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Thanks be to God. I'm sorry, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Amen. Thank you. What's the uh, mission statement for Red Bull? Does anybody know? The catchphrase? Red Bull gives you wings. And James brought this in for me to use today. Thank you so much. God gives you wings. And the Isaiah passage speaks to that. But in the, in the situation where God gives you wings in your daily life through the ups and downs and all the good, bad, and the ugly of what happens in your daily lives, what bugs you? Do any of you have a pet peeve that really irks them? You, I mean? Any volunteers? Any pet peeves over here? No, totally mellow people. Any pet peeves over here? Well, one of my pet peeves, I have a few, is people who use phones in restaurants, especially when they're sitting right in front of each other or they're obviously on a date and they feel it's more important to talk to some nameless, faceless person than it is the human they're with right now. That bugs me. I actually get weird when I see that because I think this is just another sign of the impersonal nature of our culture marching us ahead into doing and thinking things that hurt people. I want to define for you this morning some definitions I made up for fear and worry. Fear. Fear. Replacing a trustful relationship with God for a personal God of yourself. Replacing a trustful, vigorous, alive relationship with God for a personal God that someone's made up. When I think of personal God, what the scripture says is anything in our lives that we put as more important than God is now our God. We don't like to think of it that way, but that's what the scripture says. So fear is replacing a God we make up for the eternal God. And therefore, we trust in this God we made up, and that God always leaves us hanging. Unlike the eternal God of the scriptures. Worry, replacing a solid stance with God for an unstable stance built on the shifting sands of yourself. Worry has happened because we've built our lives on the shifting sands of stuff we've made that doesn't hold up under the stress and tension of life. Isaiah 40 verses 6 through 8 on that note reads, a voice cries, cry out. And I said, Isaiah says, and I said, what shall I cry? All men, in other words, like cry this out to the people. All men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the breath of the Lord, when the breath of the Lord blows on them, surely the people are like grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our Lord stands forever. So when we place our trust in things that are here and there, we fall down. God is personal. God gives you personal strength and power. Because we put our trust in these on-again, off-again things, we lose our focus. Verse 27. 
lose our focus because we concentrate on stuff that's always changing and flexing and moving around and the sands under our feet are pulled out, washed out, etc. from us. Verse 27. Why do you say, O Jacob, and complain, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, my cause is disregarded by my God. In other words, my cause seems to be passed over by God. Why do we get out of focus like this? How does this happen that we get out of focus? Too often we think we have a right to do what we want to do. And God has to fit into our expectations. We lose our focus because we think we have a right to do whatever we want to do, and then we take God and we try to shove him into our expectations. But God steers the ship, and God determines the directions of our lives, and God determines the directions of all the history. Our focus comes to us through understanding and living that. An illustration here from Teddy Roosevelt. Whining and being out of focus leads to complaints. Teddy Roosevelt said, complaining about a problem without posing a solution is called whining. Complaining about a problem without posing a solution is called whining. Oh, does that hit me? How many times have I whined about problems without providing any understanding or solution that could be worked on by God's people? We've all done that. We're all guilty of that. Teddy Roosevelt's talking to all of us. Therefore, we need clarification in our focus. We need redirection in what we're trusting in. Our focus and our attitude needs an uplift. Verse 28, do you not know? Have you not heard? This means God has spoken his truth for many, 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 many times to us, but we weren't what? We weren't listening. We didn't want to hear. We wanted to do what we want to do. And so the passage says, we're doing what we want to do. We can't hear God because we're screaming our own attitude so much. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary. In his understanding, no one can fathom. Where it says here, the ends of the earth, that means God has created, takes care of, watches over everything from the borders all the way through his creation to the other border of the universe. He's in charge. God's focus is on the long haul, and the human focus is often on the short haul and the immediacy of the situation. We want stuff right now. I love it when my kids years ago would say, Dad, how come the microwave takes so long to cook our food? And I remember myself saying that, because when I grew up in high school and college, we didn't have those things called microwaves. We had to actually, what? Cook stuff, instead of just wave it. Well, I've, I'm as guilty as them. You know, a lot of things that I cook take a minute in the microwave. I don't know how to cook very well. I just heat things up. Our world is heating up around us. Do we know what's going on? Do we understand how to be God's people in that situation? Youth at any age means insistence and demand for immediacy. You know, we got a bunch of 80, 90, 100 year old people who think like a youth. In other words, demanding immediacy and insisting it. 
But God's focus is on the long haul. The human focus is often on the short, immediate haul. Because of our distortion of focus and because of our distortion and lack of patience, God promises us to transport us into his world, which is right here and now around us, which is full of hope and not of shifting sand. He offers us hope, not shifting realities around us all the time. He offers us a directive and a direction and a trust relationship. God promises to transport us into his world that's built on hope. Verse 29 through 31. God gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youth that is that immediacy perspective of any age, not wanting to wait for God at any age. Even youth grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord, there again, hope in the Lord, will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles, they will run and not grow weary, and they will walk and not be faint. Hope is such a powerful biblical word. I remember years and years ago hearing Tony Campolo at a conference in Boston, and it was so amazing to me what he said that I've never forgot it. He was talking about going to preach at a conference. A bunch of Southern Baptists, because that's what he is. They were going to preach at the Southern Baptist concert, conference, and he had made a promise to God years before that he would continue giving to missions in addition to his already existing tithe to the Lord Jesus Christ. He would continue giving to missions as long as his car held out. Well, by the time he went to this conference, that car was hanging low. And that car was ready to go. In fact, Tony says, as he drove into the mission conference parking lot, he goes, this car is not going to make it back to Philadelphia. This car is dead, dead, dead. And he goes in, feels great because that car is done. And he's released from his, commit, from his promise to give God money to missions until his car died. Well, that car was done. He walked in, and I remember Tony saying, I preached great. It was amazing how powerful that conference was. And he also was thinking, I'm going to go out of here, and that car is not going to make it back to Philly. And so he goes out, he gets in the parking lot, and this amazing depression hit him. And the depression was because he looked down at his car, and there was four brand new tires on that car. The deacons at that church would sponsor the conference saw the condition of his vehicle and they say a man of God of this stature should be driving a better vehicle than this and so they put a check on his front seat for four thousand dollars to help with the repairs and they put four new tires on his car Tony drove that car for another five God comes to your aid when he knows you need it, not when you think you need it. Verses 6 through 8, I read earlier, talks about the human condition. Verses 28, 29, and 30 talks about God coming to rescue us in our human condition. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength, in verse 31, they will soar on wings like eagles, they will run and not grow faint, and they will walk and not be weary. Eagles. We think of them as very strong birds, which they are. We think of eagles as mighty animals, which they are. But, you know, an eagle, once it gets up there, in the sky and start soaring, its wings are only used as rigid planes 
to keep it up because the wind keeps the eagle up. In other words, it's hard for the eagle to get up there because they're pretty heavy, but once they're up there, the wind comes to their aid and they are soaring hither and yon because their wings are so strong they're able to keep them out straight and gather all that wind underneath them. We are like that. God has made us strong and able, but not strong enough and not able enough to do all the things God has called us to do or to be the people God has called us to be. So it's the Holy Spirit that lifts us so we can soar with Jesus and his church. Eagles soar not by their powerful wings, but by the wind's currents lifting them up upon their rigid pinions. Those waiting, those of us who are waiting, we are preparing ourselves to be lifted up by God and carried aloft by the Holy Spirit in his time, in his way. We have to wait for his power to come upon us and then carry us in his time, in his way, not the way we want to, not the way and the when we want to, but when he wants to. We have to be patient and wait for him. Who has ever asked for and prayed for patience? Don't you hate that? Because when you pray for patience, God does what? He gives you opportunities to learn what it's like to be patient. And I don't like it. I have learned long ago not to pray for patience. Because why? Because he teaches me every time. So I've learned my lesson. I now pray for patience and I get ready to wait. Because through waiting is how God brings his hope to you. Because it takes time for us to get out of the way. So we're waiting so God can work within us and move us out of the way so his strength, power, and spirit can come into our lives. So God propels us and releases us into his ministry. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They'll get strength again. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary and they'll walk and not be faint. In other words, God will lift you up by you being patient. He will allow you to run. He will allow you to walk. He will allow you to be the people of God in his time, in his way. Oh, I'm on the wrong page. Sorry. Um, hope in the Bible means rock solid, not wavering, not fleeting, not temporary. As I've said to you before, the word hope is more solid than this pulpit stand. I had a car in seminary, and I named my car, well, this was after I was there a while and I was driving my work truck as a carpenter and etc. I had a car that was all beat up and dilapidated and destroyed and I had the car right about the time I heard Tony Campolo give his thing about his car and so I named my car Elpis which is the Greek word for hope and I put Elpis on the dashboard I put a little sign on there you're riding in Elpis the hope you know and I knew for sure this car is not going to last because it was what? Dead, dead, dead. Guess how many years that car lasted? I couldn't stand it. It lasted four more years. And then I ended up giving that car away to another seminarian. And guess how long it lasted there? Three more years. Four and three is what? Seven. God's holy number. And so I was like, I learned my lesson. Have patience, Jim. God's going to work it out. Hope is anti-fear because we know personally the God who is trustworthy. Again, hope is anti-fear because we know personally the God who is trustworthy. Hope is anti-worry 
because we know personally the God who has built our lives around him by the power of the Holy Spirit. Hope personally with Jesus takes away your fear gradually, gives you hope through patience gradually, and removes your worry from your lives. Let's pray. Lord, we struggle with that worry. We struggle with that fear. We struggle with the fact that we're worrying and we're fearful. Those are all things that are often seen in our lives that besiege us. And we pray, Lord God, that you personally will let us hope in you and remove slowly the fear from our lives as we trust in you more so. Lord, we pray today, especially for Texas, where they are reopening at a rapid rate, and we pray for your blessing upon that process. We pray for Russia, as they are tied up some amount with their politics. We pray for Marjorie, Betty, and Betty in nursing homes, as they are waiting for their complete and total recoveries. We lift up Harold as he continues to recover from the ulcer on the aorta. We also pray today for Trinity's discipleship ministries, small groups, teaching ministry, and one-to-one -one growth. We pray for Trinity's team building. And also again today, we pray for Lori for removal of these headaches that have besieged her for many, many months. We also pray for Lynn Keller, who's having some health issues even this morning. We pray for Sally Ann for a victorious recovery from the surgery she is facing. A total recovery we pray for, Lord. Also, we pray for Marilyn and Christine, who are homebound and have some health concerns. We pray for your healing directly and dynamically in their lives. All these prayers are raised in Jesus' name, who has personally taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now is the time when you can give your tithes and offerings and or listen as you pray underneath the reflection music.
Amen. pray, Lord Jesus, in your name, for your mission, amongst your people. And we ask, Lord God, that you bless these tithes and offerings and these people. As the tithes, offerings, and gifts, and people are all directly involved in your mission and your ministry. In your name we pray. Amen. Now we have a celebration, a 125th anniversary celebration of Trinity Church. Uh, you, those who are here have a bulletin and those at home might have it also. We have a little litany here we're going to read together. But before that, I want to read part of the historical note on the back. The day of the dedication of our new church building, the 8th day of March, 1896. Though the ground was covered with deep snow, and the temperature was far below freezing, was a happy day for the people of First Presbyterian Church of Uniontown. Now, obviously I wasn't here because that would be perfect weather for me. And that would be a very happy day for me. Deep snow, plummeting temperatures. But that was then, this is now. We're gonna read a litany here in uh, leading up to our activities in the fall, where we will have Welcome Back Sunday in September, which will be a big festive, festive time for the people of God. We'll also have a ministry fair a day or two after, a week or two after that, where we'll have the opportunity to find out all kinds of wonderful things about what the ministry of God is doing here in and through Trinity. And also in September, we have a celebration of Trinity United Presbyterian Church birthday in the fall also. So there's going to be big activities around our fall birthday celebration also. But let us read this lit litany together. Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. Oh, this was written then just as it is now. Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and we shall dwell with them. He that walketh uprightly, and worketh righteousness, and speaketh the truth in his heart. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, and who shall stand in his holy place? He that has clean hands and a pure heart, he shall receive a blessing from the Lord. Also righteousness of God is salvation. Lift up your heads, O you gates, O ye gates. Be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors. And the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. But with God in every deed dwell, but will God in every deed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and heaven, heaven and the heavenly heavens cannot contain thee, but much less, be much less this house which we have built it. Yet, Yet have I said to the Lord, unto the prayer which thy servants pray before thee this day, that thy eyes may be open toward this house night and day. Let the beauty of the Lord, your God, our God, be upon us. And establish This house, house which we have permitted, which you have permitted to build, through the, I'm sorry, this house which we have been permitted to build 
through the gracious favor of divine providence, we do now solemnly met, dedicate to the service and worship of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Just a reminder, this building on this end, the sanctuary end, was built and dedicated in 1896, but the Presbytery of Redstone was here since before 1799, so there were Christians here a long time ago. And praise the Lord, there's Presbyterians, Catholics, all kinds of believers joined together in the big church of God. May the joy of Jesus Christ go with you today and all days. Amen. <laughs>